Well, good morning, guys. Welcome to The Well. Thank you for joining us online. My name's Austin. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, just to give you a heads up up front, we are taking a break from the Gospel of Matthew that we've been in for the last couple of years. And for this summer, we are starting a series today called The Church, A Reset. Um, and within the series, we're going to be walking through the first five chapters of the book of Acts. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to stand together for the reading of God's Word, and we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses in the um, book of Acts chapter 1. Let's read this together. Please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. It says this, In the first book, O Theopolis, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after suffering many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You've heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up in a cloud, um, lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together and we will get into our text today. Father God, I thank you for your grace. This morning, as we are looking at this book of Acts and as we walk through this for the next couple of months, I pray that you would reorient us as a people in these disorienting times. Uh, Father God, would you give us clarity? Would you give us direction for the path ahead? Uh, Father, we love you. I pray that we would glorify Christ alone on the back end of this. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, again, guys, um, my name is Austin. Just want to thank you for being with us today. Uh, back in January of 2014, my family moved from Denver, Colorado, along with a couple other families, to Abilene, Texas, to, to, to join some families to start this church um, the well, the, the church that you are now currently watching. Um, and we got here, I actually got here a little bit before my family, but on January 3rd of 2014, I showed up in Abilene, Texas. Um, and we really had this plan of, of building a core team, just being in Abilene, gathering some people, and maybe a year or two down the line, starting some uh, corporate services that we could then build from and slowly uh, build an organization that we could make disciples and then down the road plant even more churches. Well, we had our first uh, vision meeting or our, our first interest meeting on January 18th of 2014. We've been here for about two weeks and we had 65 people show up. And then we had a second meeting the next week on January 25th, and we had 80 people show up. Most of those were students at the time, but we had 80 people show up at our second interest meeting. And so being a very Im impulsive, excitable man, um, seeing all of the interest in this thing up front, all the plans that we had of slowly building this thing over time, getting a core team, and then eventually getting into corporate services, were pretty much burned on the spot, okay? And we stepped into corporate gatherings almost immediately, um, which ultimately was probably before we were ready for it, which made for some stressful years on the front end that I need to take full blame for, okay? So that really is just to tell you that from January of 2014 to March of 2020, um, which is just kind of a, a recent moment here, we as a leadership have really been sprinting, trying to keep up with what the Lord has been doing here at the well. 
And in these last couple of months, we have, uh, because of the disruptions that COVID-19 have brought about, um, we have stepped into a season. I need to clarify here because this season has actually brought about a, a busyness that is different from our typical busyness, but it's also provided this space where we've had time to pause and to really reset as a, a, a young church that has been running hard for the last six years, trying to keep up with what the Lord is doing here, okay? And so one of the reasons that we wanted to step into this book of Acts, specifically the first five chapters here this summer, is because this book is the story of how the church began. And if you want to know what the church should be about, and when I say the church, I'm not talking about brick and mortar. I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about services. I'm talking about a people who have been called by God and gathered around the person and the work of Christ. And so if, if we want to know what we as the people of God should be about, one of the best things we can do is go back to the beginning of the church and see what the people of God were about back then. Now, in addition to this, um, back in 2014, this series these, uh, that, that we're going through right now is actually the exact same series that I started the church with when we were brand new back in, um, I, th I think we started it in February. Um, and so it, it's interesting. And back then, I, I, I think I had named it the Church 101, which is not extraordinarily innovative. OK, we have grown and that now we have a creative team and we're naming things a little bit better. But what this means is that not only in us looking at this book of Acts is, is us examining the, the, the church at large in its inception, but in a lot of ways, we're also going back to the beginning of our church, The Well, because this, is, this book is a foundation on which this, this church was started and laid. And so my hope is that for these next couple of months, as we look at these chapters in the, in the book of Acts, um, they will serve to reset and to reorient us as a people for the path that God has ahead of us, okay? And so what I wanna do is I want us to look at the book of Acts in general quickly, and then we will look at the text that we read a little bit ago and we'll provide some application on the back end. Now, um, just to give you a little bit of background in the book of Acts, this was a book that was written by a guy named Luke who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And one of the things that, make, that makes Luke's perspective unique is that Luke, by trade, was a physician. And so this guy, no offense to physicians, was a very tedious and thorough individual. And this is in comparison to other guys like John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who processed the ministry of Christ and the world at large really through his emotions, which is why his Gospel is crazy, and I love it, okay? Or in comparison to Mark, who really was writing on behalf of Peter, um, which if you didn't know that Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark is the first-hand account of Peter, and those guys focused mostly on these big explosive events in the life of Jesus, but they weren't awesome with the details. Luke, on the other hand, was very meticulous with the details, and he made sure that all of his thoughts were clear and that he had all of his ducks in a row from an information standpoint before he wrote anything down. You see that in his gospel, and you will also see that here in the book of Acts. Now, it's likely that Acts was, wrote, was written in the early 60s A.D., um, which was really right before this intense persecution broke out against the people of God at the hands of the tyrannical, crazy ruler that was Nero over Rome at that time. Nero, if you don't know anything about him, he had a favorite horse that he, um, that, that he put in Parliament. He made a horse a part of his cabinet. He executed his own mom. This guy was a crazy man. Okay, and he was also, um, he, he, well, he started this persecution that ultimately was, was really, um, had ebbs and flows of intensity up until about 300 AD when Constantine legalized Christianity. But it was Nero that really started this persecution for the people of God. And during this neuronic persecution, um, the, the, the thing that, that started it was that Rome at one point um, caught fire and burned massive parts of the city. 
Now, it's a collectively thought at this point that Nero himself started the fire to make room for his golden palace in Rome, that if you go there today, is still pretty close there to the Colosseum. But back then, Nero needed people to be a scapegoat and to blame for the fire that had broken out in Rome. And the easiest people for him to blame were the Christians. And this gave him leverage and gave him the um, capital to start this unbelievably brutal um, campaign against the Christians of that time. And so starting in AD 64, there were Christians that were being thrown into the Colosseum and ripped apart by wild animals. Um, there's stories of Nero impaling Christians and stuffing their shirts with wax and then lighting them on fire to illuminate Rome in the evenings. He sawed Christians in two. They were beheaded and boiled in oil. It was a terrible time for the people of God. And I would just imagine that if Acts were written after 64 AD, then Luke definitely would have mentioned this persecution that was going on in the church, but he doesn't say anything about it. And so we can assume, I think, um, that, that Luke wrote this history, an unbelievably encouraging account of the beginning of the church, likely right before that persecution began. And so I imagine that this, that this letter from Luke was one that circulated those early churches in the 60s and gave these people some strength and grounding in the middle of a cultural moment that would have been disorienting, disorienting confusing, and outrageously painful for the people of God. Now, I, I, it may not even be fair for us to make this comparison, but where we are today is it, we, we are not being boiled in oil. We are not being sawed into. We're not being thrown to wild animals. We are not being made into um, makeshift tiki torches for a tyrannical ruler of our day. But we, as the people of God, are also in some confusing and disorienting times. And I think like the early Christians, we can find a lot of grounding, encouragement, and um, reorientation by examining this letter and seeing how God used um, ordinary, uneducated people that were filled with his spirit that, according to Acts chapter 17, completely turned the world upside down with the message of the gospel. So this is an exciting book for us to be walking through, not only just because of where it's at, um, because of what it tells us about, but be also because of how historically it's been used by the people of God. All right, so let's start to walk through these 11 verses. And I want us to get to the end of this quickly because um, I have an application that, that I, I think is really going to land well for us today. Um, here in verse 1, we're told that Luke is writing to someone named Theopolis. Very cool name. Uh, but the, in the Greek, that name means one who is loved by God or one who loves God. And so really, um, it's unclear whether this is just a guy named Theopolis that really loves God and is loved by God, or if this is just a name that Luke has chosen to use to refer to the people of God in general. And personally, I tend to think that it's the latter. I think he's writing just to the church in general and has chosen to use this designation of Theopolis to talk about those who are loved by God and those who love God. Now, down in verse 3, we're told that Jesus was with his disciples for 40 days after the resurrection, talking to them about the kingdom of God. Luke is the only writer that gives us that time frame. Okay, he's the only one that tells us there was 40 days between the tomb and the, or, yeah, between the tomb and the ascension. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6 tells us that um, Jesus, after the resurrection, actually presented himself to over 500 of his followers. And so what's happening here is this is an entirely different situation than you get with like Muhammad who started Islam or Joseph Smith who started Mormonism. See, this wasn't one single witness that saw some miraculous event that led to a new religion. Instead, what we see is that Jesus was around for 40 days hanging out with 500 people after his resurrection. And that was the thing that really laid the groundwork and gave the excitement for this movement of the spirit that is Christianity um, in the weeks following, okay? So then down in uh, verse 28, 
Uh, actually, sorry, verse 4, what we see is that in Matthew 28, Jesus has already given this great commission to his followers. And we'll get to that in a couple years in Matthew because we've been there for a while anyways. But what he says is that I'm now sending you because he's got all authority in heaven and earth and then he promises that he's never going to leave them. And in the middle of those encouraging sandwiches, uh, in, in the middle of the encouragement sandwich that Jesus lays there in Matthew 28, he tells them to go into all the world and to make disciples. And then what's interesting is in verse 4, he gives them that commission, but then he tells them, but you need to wait in Jerusalem. Don't go and make disciples yet because you don't have any power to do it. He's telling them that they are going to be absolutely worthless and fell miserably if they don't wait to be filled with the Spirit to have the power to actually engage in the thing that he has commissioned them to do, which is to make disciples. Okay, So then from verse 4, we get into verse 6 which I find to be this fascinating interaction. And before we read it again, I just want to remind you of where, what these disciples have been through for the last three years. Okay, if you remember, they were the people that Jesus had, had called to himself and they followed him around for the last three years. Jesus had other followers that he taught and that he walked with, but the lion's share of Jesus' time and ministry here on earth was spent with these disciples. And he spent his time in ministry while he was here on earth telling them about the kingdom and the implications of the kingdom of God. And then we're told at the beginning of Acts that um, for the last 40 days after the resurrection of Christ, he has been walking with them and telling them about nothing but the kingdom of God and the implications of that kingdom. And just to give a little clarification here, when I talk about the kingdom, I'm not talking about a place that is, um, that, that is occupied by a certain people. We're talking about a spiritual kingdom without a physical location, without an ethnic majority. This is a kingdom that is available for the entire world, and it is a kingdom that is represented by the reign and the rule of God in the hearts of people. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, that's what we're talking about here. And so what we see is that Jesus now is sending these guys out, spent three years with him, training him, talking about the kingdom, and now he's taking his hands off the wheel and he's sending these guys out to preach about the kingdom and to make disciples of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus' work here on earth is done. His ministry is over. He's accomplished what he's need, needed to. The cloud is starting to form around his feet, and he's about to be elevated back up into heaven. And so his disciples in this moment have one last chance to ask Jesus for clarification on anything they need clarification on. They have one chance to ask him a question before he is elevated back up into heaven. And this is what they ask. Look at verse 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? See, what this shows is that after everything that they've experienced, everything that they've been a part of for the last three years, these guys haven't understood anything. They haven't comprehended any of the um, implications of what Jesus has been trying to establish here. They're still expecting Jesus to stick around and to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and then to, for the, him to give them kind of positions in his kingdom so they can rule over the, um, the Israeli people together and then take them back to the prominence that they had under King David. They are still expecting an earthly kingdom that rules over a specific race of people. And Jesus now is leaving, and we see these guys are as lost as they have ever been. Which makes Jesus' response to them here in verse 7 through 8 all the more beautiful. Look at this. He says to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Right. So the thing is that the success of if the success of the mission of God 
were completely contingent upon the competency and the intellect of the guys that have followed Jesus around, everybody's hosed, right? Nobody, the gospel's not being proclaimed. The church is not being established. Um, the world is not being turned upside down. Hearts are not being transformed. And everybody is going to forget this guy, Jesus, a couple weeks after he floats up in the cloud, right? But what Jesus knows to be true is that these same ordinary, incompetent, dense as a brick fisherman, when you fill them with the power of God through the Holy Spirit, these guys are going to be absolutely unstoppable for the kingdom of God. These same ordinary guys, when filled with the power of the Spirit, Jesus isn't even worried about it. They give this ridiculous, stupid question at his last moment here on earth, and he's not even frazzled by it because he knows that when they are filled with the Spirit, nothing is going to be able to thwart the, the, the advancement of the kingdom of God here on earth. The gates of hell will not be able to topple the church that will be established through it. It's just this beautiful picture. See, and Jesus responds to them, and he tells them that once the Holy Spirit comes and you have been clothed with power from on high, you're going to be my witnesses first to your immediate context, to Jerusalem and Judea. So you need to go tell your friends, you need to tell your coworkers, you need to tell your family, you need to tell people in your neighborhood about how to be made right as a sinner with a holy God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. See, and that's still how it works today. We are called first to our immediate context. He then says, go to Samaria, which would be people that were like them, but they had no connection to it. It'd be like going to Lubbock or Midland for us here in Abilene. And then at the end of that, he says, now I want you to go to every nook and cranny of this world and tell people about the goodness of God found in Jesus Christ. See, and this is still the progression of mission for the people of God today. You are sent first to the place that you are. Just because you're not in Africa, just because you're not um, in Mexico somewhere does not mean that you haven't been sent to where you are. We are sent first to the place that we are. And that locality of sentness then leads us into these progressions out to the end of the ends of the world. But we are called first to the place that we are. And so church, as the well here in Abilene, Texas, what are we doing? How can you be that, that agent, that minister of reconciliation to, to move the gospel ball down the field and to, to make disciples of Jesus Christ in the context and the place that you are today? And there is so much more that we could say to that, but I really wanted to get to these last couple verses here in verse 9 through 11. And what we see in this text is really what I believe to be a, a life-changing, life-altering moment for these guys. Because what we've just seen here is that Jesus has floated back up into the sky, and all of a sudden, everything that these guys had expected to happen has just changed. Right? I mean, they were expecting Jesus to stick around and to establish an earthly kingdom with, with ethnically Jewish people. And instead of doing that, he's floated back up into the sky and he's gone. And so we find them in these verses where they're just standing around and they're staring into the sky. And without question, they're just thinking, what in the world just happened? What just happened? And then there's this funny moment where these angels show up and they actually kind of belittle them for looking into the sky and they ask them the question, why are you looking into the clouds? And I would assume that Peter was like, Be because Jesus just floated. Like he, there was a cloud that showed up and he elevated into the sky. So why are you asking us why we're looking into the clouds? But more than that, I think the fascinating response that these angels have to the disciples is for them to say, why are you looking into the clouds? Because Jesus is going to come back the same way he went. And so there was this charge from the angels to say, listen, Jesus is going to come back, but it's go time for y'all. 
it's time for you to get to the work of making the disciples that Christ has called you to. It's time to get to work. And I, as I've thought about this this week, I think this is how this, it, it, I think there's a way that this connects with us and where we are as a church in our time. Because I don't even have to tell you, in the last three months, everything that you and I and the world itself um, just took as a common thing, we took it for granted, all of a sudden those things have changed. In the last three months, we have been introduced to and the world has endured this rapidly spreading deadly virus that has killed tens of thousands of people in our world. And at this point, there doesn't seem to be a solution to this virus. And within that, we see that the world itself has shut down. And even the expression we have um, had grown accustomed to for the church has completely shifted and changed in the last three months. And because of this pandemic, we see that our world has been um, brought into the greatest economic crisis that our country has experienced since the Great Depression. Not only that, but in the last few weeks, as JR talked about last week, we have seen years and years of racial tension because of systemic oppression of a people based upon the color of their skin boil to the surface in the form of protests rallies and riots after the death of George Floyd. And see, all of these new cultural realities have again left the people of God confused and looking into the sky and thinking, what in the world just happened? <laughs> What's going on right now? So as we are in the midst of these confusing and disorienting moments, my hope is that we would be reminded, as the disciples were in this text, that just because this is not what any of us expected to happen does not mean that Jesus is not in control. None of this surprised him. None of this caught him off guard. And I believe that in the midst of these confusing moments, the church of Jesus Christ has a job to do. See, the cultural disruptions from this virus and the needed social shifts that we see with the protest, I believe, are opportunities for the people of God to wake up and join in with what God is doing in our world. And so we need to hear the words of the angels here to the disciples really as words to us saying, listen, Jesus is going to come back. There's an end to all this. There's a point coming in history where there will be no tears, where there will be no war, where there will be no protest, where there will be no um, fracturing and, and, and racism because of the color of people's skin. There's that point coming in time down the road. Jesus is coming back to make all things new. But for right now, we need to stop looking at the sky and get to work. It's time for us as the people of God to join in with what God is doing in this world. See, I have thought about in these last few weeks and even months about being excited about the fact that in this season, there's been this needed correction where we as the, the church of Jesus Christ have this opportunity to talk about and to live out a true biblical anthropology, which tells us that all people have been created in the image of God and based upon the fact that they carry that imprint and image, we are all, all skin colors, black, brown, white, red, are entitled to the dignity, respect, value, and worth that comes from carrying that imprint that is the image of God. And y'all, a way to treat someone with dignity in these times, I believe, is for us to be quick to listen and very slow to post on social media. Just resist that urge inside of you. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. May we be a people as the people of God who can show dignity to others by empathizing with their brokenness 
and by engaging in the brokenness of those who have been marginalized in this world because of the color of their skin. We have an opportunity as the church of Jesus Christ to step in to what we see happening in our culture today, to speak out, to engage, and to be those ministers of reconciliation that we're called to be in Christ. In addition to that, I've also been excited to see how this season I think is taking us back to a biblical view of the church and that we get to see church now. And what we have experienced is that church is not just a building you show up to or a service that you attend or you listen to a person like me talk about the Bible. Instead, being a part of the church is not you simply attending events. It's about You as a believer who's been adopted into the family of God, filled with the same power of the spirit that we will see these men and women of God in the book of Acts filled with. You have been equipped, you've been given the gospel, and you have been sent with the commission to make disciples for Jesus Christ. You and I collectively are ministers of that gospel. We are a a nation of priests It's no longer about clergy and laity. It's about the people of God existing in diversity yet unity for the same end and the same purpose of seeing Christ glorified here on earth. And so we can we have been taken out of this moment because what we've seen is that services in our churches have been canceled. But church, the church has not been canceled. The church itself, as the people of God gather around the person and the work of Christ, continues to thrive even in the midst of trial. And so as we, in these coming months, walk through these first five books, or these first five chapters of the book of Acts, my hope is that we would have this moment of reorientation and encouragement and pause as we step into what God is calling us to in the years to come. I love you guys. Um, I'm going to pray for us and we will continue to worship either in your homes or in your GCs together. Let's pray together now. Father God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for what you have done in our lives and who you have made us into, that you have indwelled us with a new identity that is the very identity of Christ. God, may we see in this season, actually, I pray that you would take this season and have it be this moment of recalibration of our thinking, recalibration of our feeling about what the church is and who the church is and what the church has been called to. As we as a community step into um, a new building, as we step into a new season as a congregation, I pray, God, that you would reorient our minds around the mission of God. Jesus, I pray that you would give us um, an urgency, but also a strength and a depth of conviction. I pray that there would be people in the church today who have always just been timid to engage in church activities, felt like they weren't educated enough or, or, or um, I don't know, enthusiastic enough. God, would we see that today that the church is not a service people attend to watch professionals perform, but rather the church is a people of God that have been gathered around the person and the work of Christ. Lord God, we love you. I thank you for your grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.